Good evening, everyone. I see uh, we've just opened up the Zoom meeting, so uh, I see everyone coming in. Thank you so much. Um, if you've tuned in before, you probably know I'm Alicia Barrett with Binnies. And tonight, as you see on the screen, and hopefully have some wines in front of you, we're going to be talking about Chile. And, you know, really one of the most dynamic wine producing countries right now in the world. It has a very rich history in wine production that we're going to explore today. And from the first plantings there in the kind of mid 16th century to present day, it's really come a long way and is now exporting a majority of their wine production. Our expert for the evening who will be guiding us through our four wines is Julio Alonso, Executive Director of Wines of Chile. So Julio, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a great Thursday. I'm here talking about Chile. That's a, that's a great pleasure. Yes. Yeah, it's Thursday, 5 p.m. Central. We have wines in front of us. It's a, it's a, it's a good day. Uh, for those watching, please go ahead, pour yourself a glass. If you're tasting along, uh, we're going to start with the EQ Coastal Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, so go ahead, have that in your glass. If you are if you don't have that wine, hopefully you have something Chilean uh, or pour anything so you can join in tonight. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, of course, use the chat function and the Q&A feature in Zoom. We'll get to those. And, you know, before we get into kind of the wines themselves, Lou, I know just one thing we want to touch on here at the beginning uh, is this kind of initiative in Chile now known as Sustainability 365. And many in the wine industry have kind of are using this kind of sustainable word and mostly in relation to farming and they're using it quite freely and oftentimes it doesn't kind of carry much meaning but uh, it does in Chile and for this initiative in particular so uh, can do you want to share a little bit about that and we can kind of go through what it, exactly it means and then we'll get into uh, a Chilean map and get into the meat of the stuff all right absolutely yeah, this is the Sustainable 365. It's a campaign we had crafted, crafted in the U.S. market to really communicate and and you know spread the word of the sustainability attribute for Chilean wines. Um, it's a, as you mentioned, it's a great attribute. We we started that started in 1850, a very old uh, uh, sort of concept. There was a um, botanist called Claudio Gay, which is a, was a French botanist in Chile, and he said. This is a country of amazing, you know, biodiversity. We need to protect that. And from there, we start really, as a country, I will mention, to protecting um, nature, biodiversity, and start, you know, assembling this con con concept of sustainability. Let, of course, later, uh, I would say, in the early 2000s, we start, you know, crafting the code. That's what is shown now in the screen. And we have a re really robust code with four colors in various for aspect, the vineyard, the bottling system, tourism, um, the social aspect that are, I would say, very robust and really hard to get. So it's really um, a long process and a strict process, around two years and close to three, uh, 350 requirements that need to be accepted and approved in order to become certified sustainable. Wow. Quite, yeah, quite an, an in-depth process. Uh, so how many members in Chile, you know, ballpark are a part of the sustainability code now? We have 85% of the, of the exports are, you know, wine that are under certification. Mm -hmm. That's around in acres is 120,000 acres. It's like if you put together Napa, uh, Sonoma together, that will be double than this uh, surface. So it's big um, in terms of absolute terms of actors, uh, acres. Um, so yes, we Chile is a small country in terms of wineries. We are not, you know, uh, a, a big a big country. We have around four hundred wineries in total, from very small wineries, you know, local producers to big wineries uh, that are exporting. And no, not all of them are exporting, but uh, yeah, most of the wine is exported in Chile around 70, 75% of the wine produced in Chile is, you know, exported outside the country. Um, so this is a, so it's a quite um, engraved, um, you know, certification after 10 years, we have 85% of the exports uh, certified, which is a great goal achieved. 
Uh, yes, I, I'd say so. Um, can you talk us through, and, and Julio, if you wouldn't mind, can you just speak a little bit uh, louder for me? Sure. Um, tell us a little bit about, there are some color codes which we saw, just we'll briefly go through these, but um, if you want to talk us through some of, yeah, just some of the requirements. Quickly, not to, to, yeah, very quickly. The, the, the yeah. green color, we have four colors. Uh, the green is the, you know, the vineyard management. The red is the winemaking process, including, you know, the bottling process. Then if you want to turn the slide, yeah. the next one is the orange, which is a social aspect, but it's, I was just commenting that it's pretty robust. It's around 150 requirements um, among these 350 are only uh, social. So it's a pretty, I would say, developed, uh, area in the code. And finally, the purple, which is the wine tourism, which no certification in the world uh, has today. We, we certify wineries based on their facilities, their care for the workers in the tourism side, and all the standards to really receive tourists with, you know, great, great hands and embrace them in the country. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, you, need, you need to take a, a flight and, and go to visit the wine <laughs> land in Chile. It's very nice. I, I must admit, I have not, I've not been to Chile. It, it, um, it is on my list, but just from all the photographs, I mean, it's just, it is so breathtaking. And so, you know, tourism is a very important part for so many wine regions around the world. So I'm really thrilled to see that Chile has included that uh, in its kind of sustainability umbrella, this, this code. Um, exactly. So let's kind of go to the region, if you will, virtually. Uh, we have some really fun maps. There are four of them on your screen, everyone, so you can kind of see the, the breaks between them. Uh, so why don't you, if you start with the one on the left, Julio, and kind of, you know, we're, we're talking about the, the narrowest country in the world. I think the average width is about 108 miles, um, the second longest in the world. So really a unique place, but if you want to talk us through this, this that would be great. Absolutely. Well, Chile is in the south. Uh, you know, it, as you said, is very long and narrow. Um, I lived for seven years in China, and the first thing, uh, you know, Chinese were telling me about Chile is, oh, it's like this, <laughs> showing me the shape. Because in the books, when you're small, you study the geography, they're very strong in geography. And Chile was outstanding today. They remember for their whole life because the shape, because of the shape, basically. So it's a really, I would say, <laughs> unique shape, as you can see in the map. And yeah, it's, it's an island within a continent, I will say, because in the north, when you see in, in red uh, and you see the word, the word Chile there, uh, this is the, the, the Atacama Desert. It's the driest desert in the world. Um, so in some you know, part in the history, there have been 400 years without any gout of rain in the desert. So it's really like you know, the moon or planetary you know, sort of landscape. It's in fact, the, the Moon Valley is a very uh, well-known place in the Atacama Desert when tourists go to see the stars. There's a great, you know, sky uh, scenario and it's like to be, you know, very connected with the sky. That's why 75% of the astronomical centers in the world are based in Atacama Desert in Chile because of that, you know, cleanness of the skies and the, the ability to really see the sky with great view. Um, and in the opposite, in the very south, uh, you, you will find ice with the Antarctic. So, you know, the, the country will go from the desert to the uh, Antarctica. That's a, the, the, the southernmost uh, limit or boundary. And then, um, as you can see there in the maps in the middle, uh, you will see the, um, the range of mountains, which is called Andes, which is the longest range of mountains in the world. Um, which you know unite us with Argentinians and also separate us from, from them. Uh, and it's very important for wine because of the altitude. And on the other side in the West, you will find the Pacific Ocean, which is very important as well for wine because as you can see in the last map with the you know, intense blue in the ocean, there is a current that you know, runs north from Antarctica called Humboldt Current. It is very cold, so uh, you know, that will you know, uh, provide this coolness in the mornings to the vineyards that are close to the ocean and also will provide us with a great variety of seafood. 25% uh, of the fish in the world live in the humble current species. So you will have a, you know, a very nice array of seafood and fisheries close to the country. That's why our menus are based on seafood and fish. 
most prominently. And, you know, Hula, if you wouldn't mind, uh, relatively recently, um, you know, just talking about the Costa and the Entre Cordilleras and the Andes, these zones, and if everyone can kind of take a look at the map in the middle at the bottom, it, it shows those colors. We kind of see the, the bluer colors along the coast, just to highlight the diversity here, because we get that coolness from the Humboldt current. So we had a lot of fresh kind of high acid, beautiful wines along the coast of Chile, which we're gonna start with with the Sauvignon Blanc. Then inland, uh, a little bit flatter, more fertile, kind of warmer there, more protected. And then we get to the Andes and we start to creep up in elevation and a lot of premium wines coming from here and kind of a, another, you know, a different microclimate. So uh, wineries, you know, depending on where their vineyards are, can have a, lo a lot of options at their disposal, right? Absolutely correct. You are right. And it's an old conversation in Chile. It's, you would imagine that it's easy to, in a way, categorize or find the DOs because you can go from north to south. You will find all these colors of these valleys from, you know, here from Copiapo to Mayeco, right? Different colors. And that's you know, the latitude difference, you know, north to south. But then some will agree that, or will, you know, have the opinion that in Chile's uh, the sonification from west to east, it's even more important based on the proximity to the Andes and the ocean. So we have three zones from um, east to west, which is here the blue, the, the green, and the yellow in the map in, in the middle. Um, the, this is the sonification from east to west, and the others are the, the, you know, the DOs from north to south. So basically Chile, two angles, <laughs> north to south and east to west, and you need to find Many options. You can be in Maipo and close to the Andes, or you can be, you know, in Colchagua Costa, appro approximately same latitude, but man, very different wines because of the altitude and the, the approach to the Andes in this case. So yeah. that's the beauty and the mystery. Uh, and, yeah, you know, and just briefly before I go to the next slide, uh, our first wine that you're enjoying right now. Um, the Sauvignon Blanc from Etetic is from Casablanca. And so you can see that on the right hand side in that map and kind of the, the turquoise, you'll see how close it is to the Pacific. So just to give you a geographical reference before we move on um, for, this, for this first wine. Uh, so let's do that. Some fun facts first. <laughs> yes, well, Chile, it's, um, I can say, I think I can say that Alicia will say it. Um, Chile is the oldest of the new world. You know? um, it, it was, it was a, a tradition starting in the 16th century. And uh, well, one of the conquistadors from Spain sent a letter to the king saying, hey, this land is uh, the promised land for wine. Please send us more, you know, more vines to be to plant. That was the, the use for the mass. I mean, they needed wine for the mass right at that time. Uh, and that's why we, our wine date is the 4th of September, which is the date of this letter went to the King of Spain asking for more vines. And yeah, so it's an old tradition in Chile, like more than 450 years from 1544 is the first uh, year of the first winery, but you know, in 1540, it was the first uh, vine planted basically in the, in the country. So it's very old in, within the, the new world. Um, and the, but then in the 80s and 1880s, uh, the, the sector took another sort of wind and uh, uh, well, we won one first uh, contest in Paris with uh, our Bordeaux wines. That was a huge, uh, a huge uh, trophy. Um, and so we started exporting to, the, to Europe and uh, another completely uh, chapter of the Chilean wine started. Um, in fact, in Chile, you have like the Bordeaux more uh, traditional, I would say, side of wine. And then you have the Mediterranean, which is even older. Pais and so, you know, all this variety that is hugely, hugely planted in Chile since the 16th century. Um, one fun story that I can tell, maybe we can connect later uh, on that, but it's the Carmener story. Carmener was one of the uh, varieties in Bordeaux, one of the varieties regulating the appellation of Bordeaux, mm -hmm. and suddenly was disappeared uh, in, Fran in France because of the phylloxera. And, but nobody knew at the time, and we discovered that the variety was hidden in Chile for centuries. And we were calling it, uh, you know, uh, Merlot Merlot, 
with a difference of Merlot Chileno, because we didn't know that it was in fact that Merlot was Carmener. And Jean-Michel Boursicot, an anthologist, went French who went to Chile, discovered this in the 1994 in Carmen Winery. And he said, no guys, you're wrong. This is not Merlot, this is Carmener. And I haven't seen this flower, um, you know, this, this leaf for never. I just seen that in the books because it doesn't exist anymore. And it was rediscovered in Chile many years after totally disappeared in France in the, 18th, in the 19th century. So very fun, you can taste now a piece of history because of that, because of the, you know, the pristine and, and isolation of Chile that uh, we have no phylloxera, we're phylloxera free, one of the only countries in the world. So Carmenet was never attacked by this disease and remained alive in the country for, for years. Um, uh, yeah, we are big producers of cab for the cab funds, uh, but we also have in total around 90 varieties in the country. So it's very, as you has mentioned, very diverse and vast. We have 23 different uh, climates and then a variety of beautiful terroirs and soils because of the volcano influence and the ocean. So we have 90 uh, you know, varieties in total. And yeah, US market is very important for us. We are well, uh, diverse in the world. We are the first in uh, the first in Korea, first in Japan, the second largest import country in China, you know, third in UK. We are a relevant exporter uh, and producer of wine. And we have a huge, uh, I would say, challenge in the US to come back in the renaissance of the US for Chile, but we're sure we have a good argument to, to fight and to, you know, come back. Uh, yeah, and it, 10 years ago. And, you know, hopefully tonight for those tasting along uh, or, you know, maybe you'll uh, hear us describe the wines and you'll go and, and purchase them. But hopefully the wines show you that, you know, maybe you were introduced uh, to Chile in years past with some of the kind of very affordable blends, red blends that they offer. And that uh, definitely kind of dominated the market for a while. But uh, here in the U.S., we are now seeing just um, again, the diversity, but these kind of single varietal wines uh, that really should be on your radar and present great value as well. So we're gonna, we're gonna get into that. Real quick question for you, Julio, from yes. um, cleverly named um, George Bizet's son. Uh, he said, I like uh, the sustainability initiative. Is there a biodynamic, organic or natural wine movement to speak of? Yes, absolutely. There is a well, we are going to taste our first wine today, just on the next slide, So, um, mm -hmm. which is from Matetich, in fact, which is a fully 100% organic and biodynamic winery, um, very close to the ocean, in fact, in Rosario Valley, between San Antonio and, and Casablanca. It's like um, eight miles, right, from the ocean. So you yep. can breathe like the marine breeze when you are in the hills. It's very beautiful. And it's, yeah, Matetich is one of the leading wineries and biodynamic movement. Um, I would say all the biodynamic wineries in Chile are well placed in the US. They're doing well, um, such as Coile or Matetich or even Veramonte or those wineries are, are well known and, 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 and they are, you know, uh, cementing a good path for, for the biodynamic movement. We have an association of biodynamic that is part of Wines of Chile. Uh, we are, they are united, they are all participating together in, you know, symposiums and, and connecting with the rest of the world. And yeah, I think for biodynamic um, agriculture, Chile, it's pretty uh, suitable for, and as I said previously, you know, we have one of the things of the sky uh, observation and uh, the pristiness of the sky is something that really helps the biodynamic movement. And some people have become uh, more and more into that movement. So it's a great trend, yes. Um, and as Julio is describing this, I've just gotten into the wine. Uh, and to speak to this, you know, Savignon Monk, firstly, as Julio mentioned, super close to the Pacific Ocean, the location of this vineyard. And uh, you, firstly, Kind of when you just when you smell it, you almost smell a little bit of that kind of saline quality that um, oftentimes uh, wines that are kind of uh, right up against an ocean uh, will kind of bring. Uh, 
Additionally, for those that love acid, this is your wine. It's, it's incredibly high in acid, just really zippy, um, but a lot of fruit. And so if you tend to kind of like those expressive Sauvignon Blancs, uh, you will enjoy this. Um, lots of citrus going on. And then additionally, kind of this pineapple, kind of papaya, um, zesty kind of tropical fruit quality as well. And of course, kind of the, the characteristic kind of underlying little bit of kind of a grassy quality, not over the top, not kind of as much maybe as you'd find in like a fully kind of bell pepper um, kind of Marlboro style, a lot more kind of purity of fruit, I think in the wine, uh, but a really kind of lovely Sauvignon Blanc. And I think that kind of the salinity that I mentioned kind of sets it apart. Uh, and again, especially on these kind of warm summer days, those high acid, really refreshing whites uh, are in demand. So check out this uh, EQ Coastal Sauvignon Blanc, just $13.99, by the way. Um, oh, and, and even, I'm sorry, I didn't even, I, I promise you I didn't read the, the slide at the bottom that, that was sent over, but it does talk about the saline quality uh, of the wine. So we're in agreement. Uh, but a, a lovely, lovely summertime wine here uh, from Casablanca. So, and biodynamic. So awesome. And a biodynamic wine for $13.99. Hard to come by. I fully agree. Yes, I think we, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, it's, uh, it's, it's the grape that it's growing the most in the US, you know, based, yeah. based on last reports. And, and we really have a role here because that, that, that you describe it very, very well, that, that freshness, you know, that, that refreshment, that um, it, it will be very competitive with the, with the other Sauvignons that are in the, yeah. In the market with a really you know point of differentiation i would say uh, yes. and that slight fruity but fresh characteristic of uh, sauvignon from chile yeah yes yeah great intensity of flavor uh, no doubt and awesome that casablanca i mean the first vines in casablanca weren't planted until the 80s uh as um you know the chilean wine industry really kind of pushed into some of these cooler sites uh, and so also look for, you know, cool climate Chardonnay from the region, uh, Pinot Noir as well. And even Julio, even some, some kind of cool climate Syrah we can find in Casablanca, right? Yeah, I, I should not say that because it's a personal opinion, but for me, the Syrahs <laughs> in, you know, in Chile are very different and quite distinct with the tapicite that it's really unforgettable. I really like light Syrahs from Chile that are normally coastal, right? From the north to yeah. south you'll find this, this Syrah that is very thin, you know, but, uh, but very sharp. And, and uh, Matati is one of them, so it's beautiful. It's a pity we don't have it here today, yeah. but you can go and, and buy it. Yes. Uh, so let's transition to some black grape varieties now. And mm -hmm. we're gonna go down, um, go to the Maipo Valley next. So you wanna tell us a little bit, I'll send to Ama, the producer, and then we'll, we'll get into the wine. Sure, sometime I will. We, we do have, a, as you can imagine, Chile is a, is a country of immigrants. Um, the, this is uh, the site of the Italian immigration. We, we do have many Italian families in the wine uh, sector, such as De Martino or Santa Emma. This is the Pavone family. Um, I believe they are from, uh, from the north of Italy. And this is a fifth generation uh, um, winery uh, from immigrants from, from Italy that they they nestle in the, the Maipo Valley, which is uh, um, very close to Santiago, the capital city. It's uh, when you arrive, Santiago is in the middle of the country, and the you can you can split in into half uh, in, in in Chile, and then you go half hour from the from downtown, and you will encounter Maipo uh, close to the Andes, and with appellations such as Pirque or you know Alto Maipo, which are uh, very well suited for, you know, red blends and Cabernet Sauvignons from there that are, you know, um, a great flag from my, so sometimes it's a, it's a very, very well, um, uh, very well sample of, of a winery from my, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, 
as was mentioned, kind of a, a long history of wine production here, given that its proximity to Santiago, many families would go he come here first to the Maipo Valley and, and plant their vineyards. And, um, and so still dominated, uh, and, and Chile as a whole, but a lot, I mean, dominated in this area by these kind of family owned wineries that date back generations. Uh, and so this, this Merlot, I think, kind of shows off some of those warm and sunnier kind of sites that the Maipo brings. And uh, just like the Sauvignon Blanc, it is not lacking in aromatic intensity and uh, intensity on the palate. And the first thing I kind of noticed in it was just that kind of dusting of, of chocolate, little bitter cocoa element to the wine. It then has kind of a mixture of red and black fruit, uh, but tend to be um, quite ripe, a little kind of almost stewed in quality. I think kind of like these dark cherries and some blueberries and currants and uh, lots of nice kind of ripe fruit and, and a nice kind of full bodied wine. Uh, so I think especially kind of a, a crowd pleasing wine and this is 100% Merlot and truly Merlot, not uh, Chilean Merlot, right? <laughs> we we say we use that for many things to give an example the coffee that it's grain coffee uh, yep. that it's you know real coffee we, we call it cafe cafe in the opposite yep. to the powder coffee we call it cafe the same the same with merlot we call merlot merlot the one that is merlot and okay. you know and merlot carmenere the one that is carmenere just a, okay. an old saying yeah we so repeat. so merlot merlot it's it's the real stuff <laughs> yes. um <laughs> And uh, yeah, and, and um, sorry, someone uh, tuning in as well as commenting on kind of that, that chocolatey um, kind of quality of the wine, uh, no doubt, but still really kind of balanced by, by the fruit, by the touch of kind of uh, signs of oak as well. Uh, so here we are, Merlot from Santa Ema. And uh, this also, just like the Sauvignon Blanc, 1399 on the shelf. So um, from Maipo Valley. Um, we're now going to uh, stay within kind of this broader central valley that, that we are in with the Maipo subregion of it. And we're gonna go to um, Colchagua Valley, which Julio I find kind of really has positioned itself for some of the kind of more high-end wines coming out of, of Chile and continuing to see them from Colchagua, would you say? Absolutely, yes. Yes, Colchagua is a, it's a very representative valley in Chile because you have Colchagua Andes, Conchagua Entre Cordilleras or Plains, and then Conchagua Costa. And it's pretty diverse, being some small appellations such as Los Lingues, what we see in the picture, and then Apalta that are, you know, standing um, and, and, you know, being the, the nest for wines that are really well known in the world um, today. It's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful valley, 200 kilometers, I don't know that in miles, but. Uh, south to Santiago, a two hours car, um, and and yes, this this is Casa Silva. It's a, it's also a family pioneer in the, in the valley, uh, quite attached to the as you see here in the picture to the horses. They are polo players, and mm -hmm. uh, they have won for many times. In fact, they they have won the World Cup of polo that family, oh. um, and they're they're really into the Chilean sports, as you may imagine. The first sport in Chile is not soccer but it's rodeo it's uh and that that sport comes to this valley the the sport of, of rodeo chilean rodeo and casa silver one of the also very active uh team in that in that sport so polo and, and rodeo uh, just to keep things out of the wine right yes <laughs> uh and so we're having their carmen year and this is one of my um when someone comes into the store and is curious about Carmenere, um, or maybe they're very familiar and love it and um, you know want a recommendation, this is one of my go-tos. I think it presents the grape variety so well um, to understand kind of what it can bring to the wine, uh, but also kind of does so in just a really approachable manner. And so I think it's a very kind of friendly wine. I think it's a lovely food wine as you're thinking about uh, kind of um, barbecuing and with barbecue or with um, kind of uh, even grilled mushrooms and grilled veggies and so forth uh, would be divine. Really anything on the grill would be great. But 
it's an it's a great entry to Carmenier. So if you're watching and haven't had the grape variety before, again, Nata, uh, it's a Bordelais varietal, but Chile kind of has made it its calling card, 100% you see in this wine. And you tend to find um, definitely kind of a, a plummy quality, some, some flat fruits as well, um, some deep red fruits, but there's going to be kind of this characteristic herbaceous quality to it that, uh, that really is, I mean, it it's, adds a lot of complexity to this wine, just that slight um, kind of green bell pepper uh, quality to it, a little bit of an herbal, even kind of a, a eucalyptus -y, uh, note to it as well, uh, but really good structure, whereas the Merlot is really kind of round and soft. Uh, this more defined in the palate, a little bit more body, but the tannins are making themselves uh, known in the glass. So just a lot here. Again, this is at thirteen ninety nine. And if you and Casa Silva makes just I, I'm a big fan of the producer and make excellent wines. Uh, and so this is their kind of entry level Carmenere. You can kind of work your way up to um, one of their higher ends that we carry uh, as well. So Carmenere, an excellent wine for for grilling. Uh, Keep that in mind, especially as you try and kind of switch up, maybe from your you know Cabernet routine. I'd highly highly recommend it. Absolutely, and it's from the Lingus. Uh, somebody was commenting on the chat. Uh, I think it's yep. George. He said, um, and yeah, the the Cabernet has made its path after I would say you know thirty years. It's a very terroir driven variety, uh, difficult to harvest. Um, you know, we we have been learning from this variety. It's a, it's a hard one. Uh, if you take it, you know, too, too early, um, it will be difficult and too late. Uh, with the same, you need to find a really, really precise timing. And there are some DOs that are that are standing for sure, you know, above others. And the Lingus is one of those. Then Peumo is another one. Um, and I would say there's it's a very restrictive and difficult uh, variety. Herbaceous, as you mentioned. Yeah. But really nice with barbecue, even with turkey for Thanksgiving will be a great. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine just to emphasize who you mentioned in the difficulty in the vineyard, if you were to pick this too early or if it's grown in, in too cool of a climate, that herbaceous quality is gonna be way too dominant in the wine and the ripeness of fruit that you need to balance that out won't yet kind of be there. Um, you know, conversely, if, if you let it hang on the vine too long or if you're in kind of too warm of a place, you're gonna lose that. And that's that's kind of the calling card and an, an important, um, attribute to the wine and, and you're just going to get really kind of ripe jammy fruit at that point so um uh, yeah i appreciate the the difficulty there but a beautiful carmenere here from casa silva check it out uh and we will we will end with uh, another kind of favorite of mine i uh, i showed this wine from la pastole uh, in a recent staff education class on chile and, uh, you know, everyone comes in looking for that kind of 20-ish dollar Cabernet, right? And so for those that haven't had it, um, pay attention. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and uh, Julio, I'll let you introduce uh, the winery and actually kind of the French influence here too that you alluded to earlier. Yes, this is a little, this is, I would say, um, 30 minutes west from the Casa Silva winery in Colchagua, but in the, in the Dio of Palta. Uh, I believe these these color these flowers are from the you know uh, the harvest time and it's apparently carmineer you will see but the carmine intense color um, I would say maybe I'm wrong but uh, this is a very very I would say special color that you can recognize um, La Postole is a winery it's a, it's a it's a it's a great story it's a fun story there was a Alexandre Lapotol uh, Grand Manier, which are the owners of Grand Manier in, in France. Mm -hmm. They have a visit tri trip in the 90s, early 90s to Chile, and they just stop in Colchagua, uh, you know, for lunch. Um, and they saw the valley and said, oh my God, this is great for wine. And they bought a property that is today La Postol, uh, you know, almost more than 35 years old. And they believe in Chile. They were, you know, French by origin. They have no wineries mm -hmm. in other side of the world, but they, uh, really um, fall in love with the country and established and stayed. And, and today La Postole, it's a, as you can see, it's a seven star hotel with a great view of the valley, very beautiful, uh, beautiful wines. There are producers of Pisco as well, which is our uh, Chilean brandy in the north of, of the country with a winemaker that's coming from Cognac, from Armagnac, in fact, 
uh, doing the same style. So it's a very it's a very beautiful project and and also a nice story. Um, what is the wine we have today? Yeah, so we're Cuvée looking to the, yeah the Cuvée Alexandre kind of line here. Uh, we also carry the Carmenier of this um, producer from the Cuvée Alexandre line, but the Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, we're drinking the 2019. And just to point out here, you'll see the blend on the screen, but Julia mentioned it is from the Dio of Alpalta. And, uh, you know, that sits within Colchagua, but it's kind of this south facing amphitheater that captures kind of all the cool breezes. In addition, very kind of poor soils on these slopes reduce the vigor of the vines. And so uh, it's an extremely well balanced Cabernet in that I love kind of, there's this herbal quality to the wine. There's like a slight mintiness. There is a, a tobacco leaf element to it. And then you get all kind of all that kind of fresh black fruit, not overly ripe by any means, but a lot of black fruit that you would, you know, anticipate with Cabernet, more defined tannins than kind of we've yet experienced uh, in the wines tonight. And again, this is kind of a staff favorite here at Benny's. Uh, at $23.99 on the shelf. I think for those, uh, especially, you know, so if you're kind of thinking through, um, if, if you drink Napa Cabernets, for example, which you really can't touch at this price point, um, but some of the, some of the more kind of balanced approaches to it, you know, I think about kind of frog sleep, for example, in Rutherford, um, that kind of, uh, they have that little more kind of an herbal nature to it. And the fruit is, you know, really fresh in style. And I think this kind of uh, almost emulates that in a little bit, so. 100% uh, French oak on this wine, I believe, uh, for about a year. So they're doing it well for $23.99. And uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous wine. I fully agree. And you see the 5% of Carmenere again. I think yeah. in the right, in the, you know, in the right blends, Chilean blends, you'll find that person just between 3 and 5% of Carmenere just to have the, the Chilean touch. Um, and I think, you know, will round perfectly uh, the wine. This is a great example. And um, if you allow me, Alicia, I'm, I'm reading from Julia yes. uh, <laughs> about tourism. I'm glad, Julia, you were um, incentivized and, you know, and motivated to go down to Chile. And please send me an email if you want more details. But yes, it's very relatively everything really, really close to Santiago or some of the wine uh, land or the wine region. So it's easy to do it. Um, and yeah, this is called Chagua to our from Santiago. You go there, then go to the coast, have a great, you know, seafood plate, uh, looking at the sea. And, um, and I strongly recommend you to go. You can take a small trip of three days of one week. Everything will work. It's the same time zone um, than the east here um, in the U.S. So you have no, no jet lag. So you, you really can do it in a long weekend then, you know, if you, if you want to be really adventurous. You can do it Thursday, Sunday, no problem. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions for you here, Julio. Um, Monique has asked, uh, in relation to these wines, how important is the production of Cabernet Franc in Chile? So we saw that as 10% of the blend in the Lapostol Cabernet. Uh, but yeah, do we see it as single varietals or plantings on the rise? Do we just see it in blends? What do you think? Yes. Um, it's normally most of the cases using the blends, Cabernet Franc. There are, however, some producers that are, you know, they're icon wines, such as Martins uh, Franco. Um, it's one of the best uh, francs in Chile with high, you know, points in all the wine publications. And um, some of them have taken that flag precisely in Colchagua Valley, the same valley we are now. Uh, but in the majority of the cases, Cap Franc will be used in blends in Chile and not as a standalone variety in our wines. Uh, but there's a small movement in that direction, precisely in Colchagua, yes. Okay. okay. I would say in terms of proportion, um, I, I don't know the exact number, but it's not greater than 5% of the whole uh, plantation. Otherwise, I would remember. It's, it's very, okay. very small. Yes. And in Colchagua. Okay. Uh, a quick um, pronunciation question here from Mimi. She said some, she's heard some people say Chilean and other <laughs> Chilean and just wanted to uh, clarify which it is. That's a very good question. Um, I think um, the right pronunciation is Chilean. Um, 
Chilean, uh, I think Chilean, some people will say Chilean with an, with an accent in the first uh, part of the word, Chilean, right? But I think um, the right way to say it is Chilean in English, yes. Okay. In Spanish, we, we say Chilenos. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. there you go. Um, I wanted to ask you about Pinot Noir. And, you know, as we talk about kind of the diversity that uh, Chile offers, we didn't taste a Pinot Noir, we do carry several of them. Uh, oftentimes a place that we bring folks looking for quality Pinot Noir at a very affordable price point. Uh, you want to talk about the grape variety, kind of where in Chile it's grown and the trends that you're seeing in the plantings. Sure, absolutely. But I think in my humble opinion that the, the, the Pinot from Chile has a great room. Um, yeah. uh, you know, in, in, in the US you'll find uh, some segment in origin and being Oregon very, uh, you know, very predominant in the 15 to 25, you know, uh, segment in wine terms for Pinot. But this is a really different um, typicity and a really different aspect for the wines. Uh, Pinots are planted from the north. We have a bunch of Pinot that are very close to Atacama, so with, with the limestone uh, soils in Limari, um, very beautiful Tabali, for example. And then you'll find going south, south you'll find Pinots um, in Casablanca, San Antonio, Leida, uh, that are coastal Pinot, coastal Pinot um, really fresh, really, um, I would say, um, with, a, with a great fruit, um, and by the way, a great capacity of age. Uh, Pinots from Chile were aging pretty well. And yeah, and today you'll find, of course you can go south and, and to the point of going to um, Araucanía, I mean, close to Patagonia, you'll find Pinots that are very, very south, uh, cool climate Pinots, uh, even, you know, if you compare to New Zealand more than Marlboro, parallel 43 huh? or 44, you'll find mm -hmm. the new way of Pinot and really south of Chile. Uh, which produces such as uh, Betich, you know, that are small, tiny producers doing great Pinots. Um, so the style in Chile will arrive. We'll, you'll have uh, really burgundy, you know, um, styles and then American style Pinots. You'll find both styles in Chile. Yeah. Need a, you, it, it's, a, it's, I think, a variety that it's really, really pushing boundaries, north to south and to the coast and also performing very well uh, in terms of point and, and articles and traction from the press. Yeah, it's a, it's a great variety. It's a small production though, but really competitive sure. today. Yeah. yeah, well, talk about another um, difficult grape to grow. Uh, that certainly is one as well. Um, yeah. So hopefully everyone, as, as you uh, tasted tonight or kind of just followed along, uh, you were exposed to some of the different varieties that you should be kind of thinking of with Chile. Got, got a little sense of the geography, a little sense of the history. And then of course, this um, sustainability code that uh, so many Chilean wine um, producers are a part of. And so as we are all kind of very conscious of that as we shop and, and try and know who's behind the wine, the people, the place, um, their values, uh, hopefully this kind of sticks with you as well. So Julio, thank you so much for walking us through um, Chile tonight. Uh, and I will um, put the slide back up with the wines we tasted in a second, but uh, any um, closing thoughts? No, thank you so much. I like the, the painting on your back. Uh, it's really, <laughs> trans now we cannot visit the wine. It's a really good way of being a tra transportation to the, the vineyards. I really miss my country in terms of visit. I haven't been there for a long time. As you can imagine, uh, but it's a great opportunity. I thank you for the, the journey. I think you choose beautiful wines from different side and style. And that's the message. You need to taste Chile. I think there is a, a great land to discover. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a really diverse, deep and interesting country to explore. So you're more than invited to come. Well, thank you, Julio. Cheers. And, uh... Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Check out our website for future uh, virtual events, uh, as well as some weekend in-store tastings for consumers. So thank you, Julio, appreciate your time.
Thank you so much. See you very soon, Alicia. Thank mm -hmm. you.